2017 and the 2017 BC election. Someone's very excited about the webinar starting out there in the, in the background. Uh, we're excited about it too. Um, I'm Joshua McNabb. I'm the BC Director for the Pemina Institute and I will be your moderator today. Uh, today's event is co-hosted with the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions and Clean Energy BC. Um, you know, this is a virtual event and I know we are uh, scattered across the province today. I do want to acknowledge that we at Pemina at least are uh, hosting this event today on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, so, as we head into this election season, we know that growing BC's clean economy and competitive advantage, tackling BC's rising carbon pollution, and protecting British Columbia from the rising costs and damage of climate change is certainly on the minds of British Columbians. Um, <coughs> excuse me, my apologies. Um, we also know from a recent report from the uh, Clean Tech CEOs Alliance that the number of clean tech companies in British Columbia is increasing, actually up 35% in the last six years. And that's fantastic. And we know the, um, the amount of equity raised in that sector has also gone up 25% to $6 billion. That's fantastic. Uh, we also saw a report released today by Analytic Advisors in their report card for the clean tech industry. And um, they paint a slightly different picture that Canada's share of overall uh, the overall clean tech market globally um, has actually declined in the last year by 12 percent. Uh, and so while we're doing well and we know we have the basis for a strong clean economy, we also know that we're not doing as well as we could be and we are losing out globally in terms of our competitive advantage. Um, so that's something that we, we we really need to take control of here in British Columbia and this is the time for us to be setting in place the frameworks to allow us to uh, take advantage of that competitive edge. At the same time we know that BC's carbon pollution is continuing to go up. We know that we are going to miss our 2020 legislative targets and we don't yet have a plan to get us back on track to meeting our 2050 targets. Um, we know that getting back on track gets harder every day and it gets more costly every day and so um, so this brings us to our conversation today. We have a lot to talk about and um, we have three very qualified candidates to uh, share their thoughts on these issues with us. Um, so I'd like to introduce them to you. So we have, uh, so first we have uh, Mary Polak who uh, is the BC Liberal Party candidate for Langley. Hi Mary. And uh, Mary has served as BC's Minister of Environment since 2013, so is very qualified to speak about these issues and we're very pleased to have her with us today. Uh, we have George Heyman and George is the BC NDP candidate for Vancouver Fairview. Uh, George is also the NDP spokesperson for the Environment, Green Economy and Technology, so also eminently qualified to participate in today's conversation. And finally, we have Andrew Weaver, who is the leader of the BC Green Party um, and is the candidate for uh, Oak Bay Gordon Head. And Andrew was lead author on four of the assessment reports by the IPCC, also eminently qualified to have this conversation with us here today. Uh, so thank you very much, all three of you, for taking the time to, uh, to chat with us. Great to be here. Uh, we have also selected uh, four panelists from the community who represent a variety of different interests across the province and we've asked each of them to pose a question to our three candidates. So I'm just going to introduce those panelists to you. You won't see them but they are here, you'll hear them. Um, we have Judith Sayers who is an adjunct professor at the Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria. We have Sybil Seitzinger, who's the Executive Director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Um, we have Brian McLeod, who's the Manager of Clean Energy Development and Operations for Clean Energy BC. And uh, we will hopefully have Tony Giaventu, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Condominium Homeowners Association of BC. So uh, uh, quite an interesting cross-section of folks who will be bringing a number of different perspectives to the conversation today. Uh, and posing questions to our candidates. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a, uh, an understanding of how the, how the conversation will work today, uh, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement, and then each of the panelists will have one minute to pose their question. Uh, after, the can after the panelists have posed the questions, each of the candidates will have two minutes to answer the question. 
Um, we're going to rotate through uh, the different order between the candidates for answering each of the questions, as well as for the opening statement. Uh, I will be enforcing the time limits on this, and unlike in a, in a uh, live debate, we have a fabulous technology here called the mute button. <laughs> Uh, and we will be using it uh, when we need to, uh, but also for the candidates, I have a sign here which I realized I think you're actually going to see backwards, but no, this look, indicates, it looks, right. it's, it looks right, okay, this indicates that you have 15 seconds left in your two minute period just to give you 15 seconds to wrap up before we hit the new button on you. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I think that's it. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to move to opening statements. The order that we will be doing opening statements in uh, will be Mary Polak, then George Heyman, then Andrew Weaver. So um, without any further delay, um, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Mary Polak for your opening statements. Thanks, Joshua, and thanks for hosting this uh, mm -hmm. and to everyone who's joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, this is, I think, the place where the practical and the uh, idealistic comes together in politics in nowhere, uh, that it, like it does nowhere else in public life. Um, it's one of those areas where we all know what we need to do, and what we need to accomplish, and we struggle with trying to balance that against the different things that we come up against in transitioning to what will be a new economy and a new world. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have to find the ways that we can do it by not just um, reducing our emissions and finding uh, better ways to be more efficient with energy usage and transition uh, our economies to that new future. We have to be able to bring people along at the same time, make sure we still have a strong economy, make sure people are still working. Um, there are all sorts of opportunities in front of us. And when Josh had talked about the time is now, all you have to do is look down south to see a very, very large economy vacating a significant part of the 21st century economy and leaving a vacuum that I think British Columbia is well positioned to fill uh, if we make the right public policy decisions. But there's no question that the single biggest challenge facing mankind is the challenge of climate change and for public policymakers, the challenge that presents is how do we uh, move forward in trying to tackle that challenge and at the same time making sure that we're keeping people whole in terms of their livelihoods, raising their kids, living in their communities. Um, it's not an easy task. It's one that we have a good record of uh, performing on in British Columbia where we saw significant emissions reductions, met our 2012 interim target, and at the same time saw our economy grow faster um, than anywhere else in Canada um, to a place where we're in a really good spot today. So there's our challenge and uh, one that we're going to be discussing today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. I'm going to hand it over now to uh, George for your two-minute opening statement. Thanks, Joshua, and thanks everyone for being with us. I think uh, we don't have to look south to find a jurisdiction that's vacated uh, the opportunities of a clean technology future or climate leadership. I think we have that here in BC since Christy Clark became Premier. We had some leadership in BC, we had emissions going down, and since Christy Clark became Premier, they've risen. They've risen by 3.3% under the so-called uh, Climate Action Plan of the BC Liberal government and Christy Clark, emissions will continue to rise until 2030, rather than reduce by 40% as called for by the climate leadership team. I think it's important to note that a balanced climate leadership team was put together, representatives of communities, First Nations, business, environmentalists, academia. They made a set of 32 recommendations the BC NDP has said we accept those recommendations, we adopt those recommendations, we adopt the targets, we made one modification because the federal uh, government came out with its own carbon pricing plan shortly after the leadership team reported. We thought it was wise and many, many commentators and members of the team agreed they thought it was wise to line up with those and fill the remaining gap with application of smart regulations, which we intend to do. So we will set targets, we will meet targets, we'll reconvene the team to talk about how those targets can best be implemented, the specific measures that need to be done, revisit it while at the same time making life more affordable for low and middle income people and easing 
the burden on emissions intensive trade exposure industries. A little later, we'll have a chance to talk about renewable energy, uh, clean technology, and energy conservation afield. I also think the BC Liberal government under Christy Clark has vacated in favor of a 1950s mega project. Okay, thank you very much, George. And Andrew, over to you for your two minutes. Thank you, Joshua. Um, the reason why I got into politics was precisely because of this issue. As those of you who've known my career will know, I served as the lead author of the second, third, fourth, and fifth climate assessment reports done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I served on Gordon Campbell's leadership team, a time when, when policy measures were brought into the province of British Columbia to put climate policy first. I watched as the BC NDP initiated a cynical campaign, an axe attacks campaign in 2009. And then I watched as the BC Liberal government under, under uh, Christy Clark dismantle the, the, the innovative policies that were brought in place one by one. And it started with the weakening of the Clean Energy Act for, for LNG. I could not stand by and talk to my students about the importance of being engaged and, not, and when they would respond and saying that uh, you know, they, all the politicians are in it for themselves, they're, they're not in for the intergenerational equity, and I would tell them, well, maybe you should run. But at one point, I had to take a look in the mirror and say, yeah, to Jane Sturt, the fourth time she asked me, okay, Jane, I will run. And I ran because, frankly, I'm sick and tired of politicians saying one thing and doing another in the area of climate leadership. The BC Liberals have no plan. The BC NDP claim they have a plan, but the single most important uh, underpinning aspect of the, of the plan is missing, and that is carbon pricing. That is why we have put in place a plan that would increase the carbon price $10 a year per, per year, uh, taking it to $70 a ton, which will be $20 above the, the, the amount that Trudeau has mandated anyway. And the reason why we do that is because leaders lead. They don't wait for others to follow. When Gordon Campbell introduced his, the carbon price to $30 a ton, he did so and brought it $30 above everyone else. So the BC NDP are saying we're going to bring it to the same as everyone else, losing a leadership position. And the BC Liberals are simply, you know, they don't have a plan. So we have the only plan that will actually meet the target of 40% reduction by 2030. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you to all three of you. We're going to go to our first panel question. Um, this panel question comes from Sybil Seitzinger from the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Sybil, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. The climate platforms released by the political parties in this election focus mainly on mitigation, reducing emissions, yet adaptation to the changing climate is also a crucial part of the solution. Due to climate change, British Columbians are facing new norms. These include more frequent extreme weather events, changing precipitation patterns that affect our hydroelectricity and food production, increasing risk of forest fires, melting permafrost, rising sea levels, and ocean acidification with impacts on fisheries and food chains. What are the key priorities and actions planned by your party so that people in this province can prepare and adapt to climatic changes that are occurring now and which will increase in severity in the future. And please be specific. Great, thank you, Sybil. And the order for this question will be George, Andrew, and then Mary. You each have two minutes to respond. Uh, over to you, George. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sybil, for the question. And I, I would differ with you a, a little bit, I, and I, as well as with uh, Dr. Weaver. I would not say that our plan doesn't focus on adaptation and mitigation, and it doesn't for the simple reason that we didn't choose in opposition without all the resources of government to say we're going to design an entirely new plan. We know the hard work that was done by the climate leadership team, the uh, comprehensive nature of the 32 recommendations, so we also adopt recommendations 24 and 25, which talk about actions uh, to address climate change adaptation and mitigation, including investing in sufficient monitoring systems uh, to ensure change can be managed effectively, to develop a policy framework to guide the government's management of risks associated with the changing climate, to increase communication to the public, to use traditional uh, knowledge when appropriate and available as part of hazard mapping, to uh, allocate appropriate resources for research and modeling, very important. We've seen a cut back on 
government research resources in any number of fields so that we can model the impacts of climate change and know what actions to take. In addition to that, we intend to reconvene the climate leadership team with some additions uh, to ask advice on an ongoing, uh, recurring basis about how we can give more life with more specific action to each of these recommendations going forward every year as we see the changes. Some of the other things that we have is a massive uh, plan to invest in infrastructure over a, over a five-year period. Part of that infrastructure will be helping uh, to ensure that uh, new buildings uh, and infrastructure can respond to change in climate, to ensure that we invest part of carbon tax revenue in that, to ensure that we protect watersheds with a big focus on people's right to clean drinking water. And instead of killing programs like uh, Live Smart, we would ensure that we that we put the resources in to maintain the kind of actions that help communities and individuals adapt. Great, thank you, George. Um, now over to Andrew for your two-minute response. Uh, thank you very much for the question. We uh, announced yesterday uh, in our press release uh, aspects of the climate adaptation strategy. I recognize that that was announced after the, the question uh, questions were prepared. We did so in Kamloops, looking at resilience in our forest sector, in the agriculture sector, resilience in the uh, um, in terms of water management, and and elsewhere. We, there is a, a BC climate adaptation strategy that exists now. Uh, we recognize that a lot of the ideas are already there. Municipalities need uh, resources to assist in adaptation. Uh, before, but many of our, our dependent resource sectors also need assistance. And so many of the things we plan to do uh, are, are outlined. I would encourage people to go to bcgreens.ca slash platform. And in that, look for our, it's, it's entitled Natural uh, Resource and uh, uh, Platform there, where we talk about resilience. You know, it's. The problem is, is it, it's, we need to step back and actually take a look at all of our resource sector, which is what we're doing in, the, uh, in, in our plan, because decision-making today is not accounting for the long-term consequences of decisions. We're finding that people are taking a Raxian approach to, to resource extraction, taking it out of the ground today, not thinking about t tomorrow, and actually not thinking about the consequences of climate on what will be around tomorrow. So again, um, I just encourage people for specific details to go to our platform document. It's very, very, very detailed there in terms of uh, forest adaptation, uh, uh, water adaptation, and uh, municipal infrastructure required for adaptation. But there is a real problem, uh, you know, the simplest example of which is storm drain systems throughout um, British Columbia have been designed for the 100-year event, and the 100-year event is no longer a 100-year event, and there will need to be massive investments in infrastructure. We believe that we have a resource, uh, we have a source of that revenue. Uh, we're very proud that we'll increase the carbon tax for the next uh, five years to get it to, until it gets to $70, and, and that's the, the, the focus of our plan. Thank you, Andrew. And Mary, over to you. Thank you, and uh, Andrew's right. We do have an existing adaptation plan um, that already has actions underway in <laughs> many different sectors, specifically though to looking ahead to what we can add to it. Um, we have in our climate action plan, um, we have investments in agriculture specifically, an area where we know uh, that those involved in the agriculture sector need funding to be able to not only plan, but start to adapt uh, their activities on the land base. Uh, we are doing the same in uh, the forest sector. Uh, there's a significant part of our climate plan that is around intensive forest management. And part of that is adaptation, uh, being sure that we are taking as much off the forest floor as we can uh, when harvesting is done and uh, planning for um, how uh, that uh, changing climate is going to affect forests and making sure that uh, what we're doing is up to date uh, with the best science around how we manage those forests uh, to adapt. Um, we also uh, are working with the Union of Municipalities. Uh, Andrew mentioned storm drains. There's a significant amount of planning that has to take place with those local governments and that will form a significant part of what's in our climate plan to update uh, the climate chart of local governments. Um, we also uh, are doing that in our provincial public sector, making sure that ministries have significant infrastructure assets like transportation um, are supported and funded for planning um, to assess what kinds of infrastructure are going to be at risk, and then therefore you can prioritize a plan for what areas of infrastructure you can be um, prepared. Then, in line with that, 
Um, of course, the federal pan-Canadian process is taking place and we've been very active uh, with them and part of the work being done is at the adaptation level which will again build on priorities for joint funding between the province and the federal government um, for the various pieces that I've mentioned around uh, adaptation and fixing infrastructure. Great. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, we are getting a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure whose who's, uh, microphone it's coming from, but I'm going to ask all the candidates and all the panelists if you can go on mute when you're not talking. Um, that would be great, uh, just to make sure we're, everyone's able to hear as well as possible. Um, with the exception of Judith, as I am handing over the next question um, to you, Judith. So over to you. Great, thank you. And hello, Mary, Andrew, and George. It's great to have this um, discussion today. Okay. You know, humanity and climate action are that First Nations are and want to be involved in. How will your party create opportunities for First Nations and clean energy, in particular, um, now that Site C has been is going ahead, the opportunities that BC Hydro to sell to the grid are basically gone. Everything that's available has been spoken for to 2019, and there's a long waiting list. We just the BC First Nations Clean Energy Working Group just finished a survey where we estimated there are 249 projects that would like to go ahead with an investment of $3.27 billion and no place to sell it, no place to do. So really want to know how would you create opportunities for First Nations and clean energy. All right, thank you very much, Judith. And we are going to go with Andrew, Mary, and then George for this question. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, Judith, for the question. Uh, sorry, I was starting my, my clock here. Uh, you know, the very first thing that we need to do, and we've committed to do this for several years, is to stop Site C. And the reason why it needs to stop is because we, are no, we know that uh, power demand here in British Columbia has been flat for, for a, a good portion of a decade. We know that the, bringing Site C on has, has essentially killed the clean energy sector in British Columbia. Uh, we know the Canadian Wind Energy Association has left BC, moved to Alberta. We know the Canadian Geothermal uh, Association is... is you know, crying foul as we're not able to, to get going here. We know uh, that First Nations across British Columbia have been opportunities they want to develop. You know, where I live on Vancouver Island, as you know, Judith, five First Nations, Timber West and EDP Renewables, wanted to invest $800 million in, to provide a wind capacity on Vancouver Island. Good jobs, stable jobs, distributed jobs in partnership with First Nations. They've walked, they've left because this government has decided that it's Site C or nothing. And it's been reckless in doing so because Site C is being constructed to provide power for an industry that doesn't exist. That is the LNG industry. And in so desperate are the BC Liberals to actually land LNG that they sign contracts to subsidize power like wood fiber supported by the BC NDP to the tune of six cents a kilowatt hour. That's a $440,000 per person per year job subsidy for an LNG plant that may or may not happen. We believe we should invest in people. We believe that we should repurpose the mandate of British Columbia Hydro to ensure that BC Hydro is used to match consumers of energy with uh, users of energy, uh, with, with producers of energy, and also it gets heavily into the business of transmission and bringing, uh, bringing marketing BC energy abroad. There, there are enormous opportunities here. We're missing out from them, and we've, we're, we're, the consequences are uh, that people are leaving BC for, in these innovative new sectors. So, you know, Site C is the, it predicates everything. That we will stop immediately and move towards distributed clean energy in partnership with First Nations. Great, thank you, Andrew. And um, over to Mary. Thank you. Uh, of course, here's another area where balance is the tricky part because uh, we do want to encourage uh, new, smaller, renewable, clean energy projects, especially in First Nations. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that ratepayers um, are not hit um, with a higher bill. I mean, the advantage of legacy power, hydropower, uh, and indeed power from Site C is that it means our electricity rates are extremely low. The disadvantage with that is it means where wind projects, solar, and others are becoming more economical in other places, it's really challenging them for, challenging for them to get 
um, to that rate level here in BC. What can we do? Well, first, in terms of funding, um, we have uh, very innovative funding programs with First Nations, well over 100 um, different ones that we have funded to help support development of clean energy projects. And there are still some uh, that are going ahead. When it comes to how we look at the future to ensure that they do have that opportunity to develop those projects, I think we have to look at things, and we are looking at things like, uh, what could we do with power purchase agreements? Uh, what is going to happen with the intertie with Alberta? We're in very um, uh, good talks with the federal government about how that wonderful clean power that is in British Columbia could be used to help um, in areas across Canada where you don't have the opportunity for uh, clean hydroelectric power. I think there are tremendous opportunities like that and I think you can pursue Site C and at the same time uh, pursue those opportunities because it allows you um, to develop sustainably and not uh, put ratepayers at risk uh, of rather large costs. Um, we have to be able to balance those two things. Great. Thank you very much. And over to you, George. Well, I, uh, I certainly disagree with uh, Ms. Polak. Uh, we have an energy policy that makes no sense in British Columbia now. It's built around a single large mega project. Uh, demand for electricity has been flat in BC for a decade. There was a report by UBC released in the last couple of days that questioned the economics of uh, this project and pointed out how uh, those economics have significantly changed over uh, the last few years since the project was approved. We don't know if it's going to come in uh, on budget, but many people are pretty sure it's going to go significantly over. The report said that there will be no demand for Site C's power for uh, 10 years, and we know it will um, cost $200 million a year to uh, have power we don't need and try to sell it on the spot market at a loss. At the same time, the cost of uh, renewables has dropped on average 50% in the last six years. Uh, so which direction should we choose to go in? We should go in the direction of renewable energy with an emphasis on the tremendous economic opportunities for First Nations in, in wind and solar and in some, uh, in some cases carefully managed for environmental impacts and uh, small hydro, those are the kinds of opportunities that will create jobs incrementally as technology improves and gets cheaper over the next one to two decades without losing um, energy through uh, transmission line losses and providing jobs on an ongoing basis in every part of British Columbia. There's one of the recommendations in the climate leadership team talks specifically about First Nations clean energy business on being used to increase economic opportunities for First Nations, but this is all being stifled and squashed by a white elephant mega project that was, uh, should have gone to the Utilities Commission, the review panel said it should have gone, and this government stubbornly refused to give ratepayers an independent expert assessment. Can't hear you, Joshua. Thank you. We are going to give the, the three candidates a small break now. We're going to turn it over to our uh, listeners and ask them a poll question on their opinions on some of these issues. Um, so momentarily, you should see a question coming up on your screen. Um, which of these essential components of a clean growth strategy should be the first priority for the next BC government? Um, so we know that all of these things are, are crucial to uh, a clean growth strategy. Um, we're asking you, you know, what you think should be the first priority of the new government um, as of May 10th uh, for British Columbia. So you can select, uh, I think you can select as many of these as you want. So uh, go ahead and click on those and we'll, we'll give everybody about a minute to participate in the poll and then we'll show you the results.
All right, so we're closing that poll up. We'll get the results up, see how people are feeling. Um, all right, interesting. Pricing carbon pollution to the federal schedule or beyond seems to be a slight winner, but all of them are clearly important um, to the participants here today. Uh, so that's great. Thanks very much for participating in that. And now we are going to go back uh, over to Tony, who I think has been able to join us. Uh, so Tony is from the Condominium Homeowners Association of British Columbia. And Tony, over to you for your question. Thanks, Joshua. Just to let you know, we've lost our screen. So that may be okay. a bit of a problem. Um, uh, note of thanks to the candidates for uh, participating. Uh, but we um, are finding that with the number of buyers in multifamily buildings, you know, in condos across the province, we're getting an increasing level of pressure from buyers wanting to know how they access energy consumption in units and buildings before they purchase. And so put that on a comparison level of purchasing a new car, which is required to disclose projected mileage and consumption. So if we were to take that and convert that into um, our multifamily buildings and combine our common area and our unit electrical gas um, services that we pay for, um, it's a substantial cost and consumers are looking at ways to trying to find that. And what that leads us to is the discussion on how would you as the candidates or your parties see implementing some sort of energy benchmarking in the industry so that um, uh, consumers have the ability to find information in advance of energy consumption rates on a comparable level before they purchase homes. Great, thank you, Tony. Um, and for this question, we will go with George, Andrew, and then Mary. Uh, so George, over to you for your response. Thank you for the question and thanking, thank you for pointing to the importance of energy conservation. We all know the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use at all and that's why as our alternative to Site C, the very first thing we focused on was a very aggressive demand side management program. Uh, a demand side management program uh, that could have continued under BC Hydro and the BC Liberal government. That BC Hydro was ordered by the government to scale back from Model 2, which was very aggressive, to Model 3, which was far less aggressive because we're awash in power that Hydro is losing money uh, with and can't sell. So we said we would, uh, we would start with uh, renovating and uh, retrofitting public buildings, saving taxpayers uh, a huge amount of money. We would then, through on-bill financing and pay-as-you-save plans, uh, help homeowners and commercial businesses do the same thing. Implicit in that is the ability to know uh, how much excess energy you're using and what needs to be done very specifically to uh, make the changes that are uh, needed to focus retrofit and energy conservation measures in the most effective way possible. This would be an ongoing plan. Uh, it would be a revolving loan fund. Uh, it is the cornerstone of uh, the plan we call Power BC, which also has renewables as part of it. And it's necessary, I think, to keep hydro rates affordable, which they've uh, certainly not been in the last five years with an uh, over 40% increase. Uh, we need to see change. We need to save energy, which will in turn save uh, ratepayers and taxpayers money by not uh, creating uh, electricity projects before they're needed as we make other changes in society for electric vehicles and as the population grows. Okay, thanks George and over to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, we can't hear you. That's the, the danger of muting. Um, thank you for the question. I agree with my colleague George here about the importance of demand side management. It is, it is some of the lowest hanging fruit. And part of that requires leadership to be shown and a BC Green government would also show leadership in retrofitting its own building to the, to the standard it expects others to, to follow. In addition, uh, education is critical because a lot of people don't realize um, how you may have a short-term savings by, by buying something that's inefficient, but over the long term, you actually lose. And so education plays a critical role. There are programs that used to be in place that used to allow people to access these uh, assistance at zero, zero um, 
uh, interest loans to ensure that they, they, they could actually retrofit accordingly. Uh, these, are, these are good ideas that we, we support as well. Uh, but more importantly, it, in terms of new construction, we have to start thinking about the future when, we're, when we need new construction. We've got to start thinking about every house being a home for an electric vehicle. It's a real problem in stratas right now where people cannot uh, find plug-in. It's a real problem with new building and it's simple changes. A dryer plug added to a building code is not that costly when there's nothing in the wall. It just it's another line and a 240 volt um, dryer plug basically. Uh, having a, pre, pre, a solar pre preheated hot water is a, is, a, is a tube to the roof. These are simple changes that can be added if you and they can be done at, at no additional cost if you start to recognize that there are other things that may not be needed like rain sheeting on single family homes. So, so there are ways of actually ensuring that the future capacity is energy efficient and ready for the new economy at the same time as you show leadership by retrofitting your own house uh, before you start telling others to do those. And when others want to, you provide the resources to allow them to do so. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and over to, oh, I've lost my order. <laughs> it would be Mary. Uh, I think I'm next. Mary, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm the only one left, so. You're the only one left. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the built environment is an area of emissions that a lot of people, everyday people, don't think about a lot, but very significant. Um, when it comes to, I, I love your idea, the uh, same idea that you have on appliances, be able to look at it and say, well, what, how does this house rate? Um, I would think, and within our climate plan, um, built environment features uh, pretty prominently, uh, the regulations that we've brought in uh, now that will uh, regulate toward more efficient buildings, I think, uh, would be a natural place to include something uh, that develops a rating system. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've got hydro featuring uh, large in the climate plan around uh, the shift toward creating more efficient use of electricity, but at the same time, transitioning to electricity in places um, where that makes more sense than using uh, dirtier power. Uh, so that's part of the uh, climate plan. Moving to net zero buildings, and we start with net zero ready buildings. Um, I think all of those kinds of things could be um, combined with your idea around making sure there's some kind of rating system that consumers could look at uh, and again providing incentives uh, for those larger buildings where they're still using boilers for example part of the plan is to provide incentives uh, for them to move to more efficient technology um, than using those uh, types of boilers that they do now um, so it's got to be a combination of the retrofitting and building new. Lastly, on the retrofitting, um, in the category of other new and interesting ideas and ones that come from communities, because uh, they're the ones who, who are on the ground with this stuff, um, local municipalities have for some time given um, a, uh, a break on increases in property taxes incremental um, to renovation for things uh, like uh, accessibility and whatnot. Uh, why not do the same kind of thing when you're retrofitting your home? That if the cost or the, the value of your home increases, then give a tax break on the incremental increase for retrofitting your home to be more energy efficient. Fantastic. Thank you, all three of you, for your response to that question. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to Brian McLeod from Clean Energy BC. Brian, over to you for your question. Well, great. Uh, first, uh, thanks to all the panelists for attending this webinar. Um, I work for Clean Energy BC, which represents over 150 private sector developers and operators, and we also have a number of First Nations members. Uh, my question is, BC has an abundance of clean and renewable energy resources. Um, other provinces, such as Quebec, have developed deliberate export strategies. Would your party support the development of a long-term export strategy for BC's clean energy? All right. Thanks, Brian. And uh, we're going to go Mary, Andrew, George. Mary, back to you. Thank you very much. It's something that already, um, if you think about what's happening on the Canada scale, uh, so we'll start there. Um, already the discussions with the federal government and with other provinces are starting to coalesce around this idea that here you have this uh, country where in some provinces we have huge uh, natural resource um, of uh, clean, clean energy and how do we make sure that everywhere in the country people have access to that, right? Um, so I think we start at home. Um, there is uh, lots of interest in um, what's happening in the power purchase agreement uh, sector. That could be a direct benefit to those um, who are in the clean energy sector when you start to think about the number of businesses um, in places like the U.S. who want to be 
um, having that clean reputation and would enter into those kinds of agreements. Those are opportunities. Of course, um, all of that means we have to do it responsibly so that we ensure that the taxpayer, or I should say in this case, the ratepayer is benefiting. But we do have in British Columbia, I think, an underutilized uh, resource, and that is the quite brilliant people uh, at PowerX, who are some of the best in the world at developing and designing these things. Lastly, I would say I think there's also some uh, uh, learning, some uh, experience to uh, draw from in terms of what that can mean around offsets um, for those who produce power under the low carbon fuel standard as well. Uh, it's not directly um, in your wheelhouse, but all of these things together could cre create a very robust system whereby we're valuing that power that's clean, um, giving it a value and creating systems uh, that allow them to trade. Um, essentially, when you look at the low carbon fuel standard, for example, what it has created is a functioning um, emissions trading system in British Columbia. So what are the opportunities that we could connect between all those different systems? I think it's there. Um, and again, it's that 21st century economy that we need to start uh, connecting to. Great. Thanks very much, Mary. And over to Andrew. Thank you uh, for the question. The short answer is yes, uh, we would uh, support, and uh, I agree with Mary, the uh, PowerX are doing an admirable job. In fact, they're bringing in uh, very many millions of dollars to the BC coffers through their success. Uh, you know, we what, it's got to be more than just thinking about trading on traditional transmission lines too, because we know that the future of, of the power grid is one of, of, of introducing widespread uh, smart grid technology to ensure that there are coupled point-to-point uh, -point DC, high-voltage DC transmission systems. We know, for example, we have lots of hydro in BC and they have lots of solar, some of the cheapest installations in the world now being put in place in southern US at three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. You know, we know that they're going to get lots of power in the sunshine there, so we might have an HVDC point-to-point -point transmission system there, but we, we know that it's windy all the time in northwestern BC, so we might have a point-to-point -point transmission system up there too. So combining point-to-point -point high voltage DC transmission systems with uh, distributed uh, production of, of of uh, electricity is the way forward for the future, something that we can get ahead of in BC and something that I think we're, 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 we should be pushing BC, BC Hydro to start thinking about uh, in, uh, more, more um, spending more time thinking about in light of the fact that, that transmitting power is, is a, a barrier right now for, for taking Alberta off coal, for example, or taking Saskatchewan off coal or, or taking some of the US states off coal. Great, thank you very much. And over to George. Well, the short answer is I also agree that uh, that we should support uh, and encourage export opportunities for BC renewables. Uh, and I certainly understand why people in clean energy BC are looking for these opportunities because there are opportunities in BC in the medium term have been completely choked off by uh, the white elephant at Site C. Uh, there are a number of things that uh, we can do. I think there's opportunities here for uh, First Nations uh, partnerships on a variety of uh, renewables. I, I think something has to happen to keep uh, the renewable ingenuity and uh, entrepreneurship and uh, technological uh, development alive in British Columbia. Uh, we saw um, the Canadian Wind Energy Association pull its uh, presence out of BC because they just didn't see a future with Site C on the landscape. Uh, I talked to uh, a number of entrepreneurs in uh, the sector, members of Clean Energy BC, who are very concerned about the future and at the same time have a lot to offer British Columbian communities in terms of economic development, jobs, as well as lowering greenhouse gas emissions here and elsewhere. So uh, we will look along with uh, a climate leadership team at any very specific measures we can take to assist in this. Obviously, we want to develop it and ensure it's developed uh, in a responsible way with respect to any other environmental impacts, but that is uh, certainly um, uh, within the realm of, uh, of possibility, and I'm sure that people in the sector themselves uh, would largely agree. I think nobody wants the, uh, the fights and disputes that took place in the past and where uh, we can help other jurisdictions we should. Uh, if we have an effective uh, a trading arm that will maximize return on that, uh, we should use it and uh, we should use it in conjunction with uh, people in the clean energy sector uh, who want to create opportunity to replace the opportunities that have disappeared over the last couple of years with a wrong-headed approach to dam construction. 
Okay, thank you very much, all three of you. Um, our next question comes from a municipal government official who wasn't able to be with us today, but I'm going to read the question. Um, uh, Metro Vancouver mayors continue to call for sustained government investment in public transit funding. Um, what's your record on transit funding and what is your commitment to funding TransLink's 10-year vision of transportation upgrades to completion? How do you see road tolls fitting into this picture? Um, and so we're going to go with Andrew, Mary and George on this question. Well, thank you for the question and I have in my hands here an embargoed release that's going out at, at literally one hour on our transportation strategy. <laughs> so, but to preempt that, I will say that we've said it publicly is that we will be supporting the mayor's 10 year vision. Uh, it's really important that we recognize that the people who know best about what transport needs are the, in their communities are the mayor of those communities. We do not support the Massey, uh, Massey Bridge extension as the mayors don't because all it's doing is kicking congestion down into the Oak Street Bridge area. We know that it cost wise, it's much cheaper to do a second tunnel as well. We know that you know we're not going to reduce the tolls on the or eliminate the tolls on the two bridges in, in, in Vancouver either. And that's a point of principle is that we believe what's needed is, is what's needed now and urgently is transportation investment. I thought it was quite cynical of the BC government to put that to a referendum when in fact it was ended up being a referendum not about transit but about translink management. We also know where the revenue will come from. We recognize that you know the mayors are, are, are seeking revenue source for our plan is to increase the carbon price by ten dollars per year uh, co coincidentally it's the same as your top priority on your poll ten dollars per year from now till it gets to seventy dollars a ton twenty dollars above the mandated fifty dollars a ton of, of uh, Trudeau so that we can continue leadership that will provide revenue that can be given back to municipalities to deal with infrastructure deficits whether it be a transportation needs in Vancouver or bike paths in Kelowna. Different communities have different needs. They need to address this infrastructure deficit. They need resources to do that. And our plan is to use the pay-per-use, pay polluter-pay model to actually get the resources to them. You know, the toll issue is a big one too. We look at the Coquihalla Highway. When the tolls were placed on the Coquihalla Highway, people used it. And the tolls were there for a reason, to ensure that the infrastructure is paid by those who use it. So that, that's, you know, that's our approach. But transit, first and foremost, continue using uh, congestion tax, uh, congestion tax uh, tolls as a means and ways of, of ensuring that uh, you pay for the infrastructure that's being built. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, over to Mary. There. Sorry, I had to remember to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Well, in terms of past um, uh, support of transit in British Columbia, no question, we have uh, now um, one of the best transit systems in all of Canada. It rivals many of the best in North America. Now, uh, at the same time, we have communities like mine in Langley that are still uh, struggling to get more and better transit. It's happening uh, in drips and drabs. We've got the new rapid bus that uh, can now get people from the valley um, to SkyTrain in about 15 minutes. That's been uh, very, very heavily used. Uh, to the 10-year plan, yeah, we've uh, stepped up to match the contribution, so we're in for the phase one of the 10-year plan, and yeah, there's still more discussion that has to take place about uh, how it's funded by the local governments. But I think it's important for us to recognize why. And it does go to the to what the uh, referendum showed. Remember that the issue of whether or not there should be a referendum uh, on uh, that new funding, whatever the mayors had chosen, uh, that actually was taken to an election in 2013, and we won that election, and that was part of our platform. Um, the question was set, and taxpayers decided that they didn't want to go that route. Well, uh, I've heard that in Langley when we look at the history of different proposals that mayors have brought forward for taxation to support transit. Um, those things have been rejected by communities. We have to listen to the public about those things. And so new taxation models do need that public input. We've promised that. Why? Because the original setup for TransLink was recognizing that in every other part of the province outside of Metro, those communities not only pay a third of their transit, but they also pay for all their health infrastructure to the tune of 40% on their property taxes. And the local mayors in Metro um, were given the, uh, the ability not to pay that 40% on their property tax so that they could use their property tax room to support transit in the area. So if we're going to be doing um, different things, we need to recognize that there's a fairness issue for the rest of British Columbia where those communities do pay a full third of all their transit. Thanks very much. And George, over to you. Well, frankly, the BC Liberal uh, 
record on uh, transit and transit funding, particularly in Metro Vancouver, is just uh, cynical. It's say one thing, do another. In 2010, a memorandum was signed with the uh, the mayors of Metro Vancouver stating that the provincial government would work with them to find funding formulas in order to increase ridership of transit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And since that time, the provincial government led by Christy Clark has said no to virtually every proposal put forward by the mayors to fund, find the funding for their one-third share, uh, capped by this ridiculous uh, divisive referendum that had a turnout that was very low. Uh, so my record, I've been, uh, I was transplant critic from a month after my election in 2013. I argued for funding, I argued for uh, transplant accountability, which as uh, Mr. Weaver said was really the issue in the referendum. And I campaigned for the referendum because whether the sales tax was the right answer or not, it was the only answer that was put forward because the Liberal government uh, essentially wasn't going to agree with anything else. And it's very difficult to put forward a combination of measures in a referendum. We said, we were the first party to say, we would fund not just 40% of the rapid transit south of the Fraser and the Broadway Tunnel, which is all uh, the BC Liberal government has uh, agreed to fund at 40%. We would fund 40% of all of the capital projects in uh, the mayor's 10-year uh, plan, including uh, new buses, including Tallow, including all of the uh, capital costs of the plan, and we would work with them to find a viable funding option to implement the entire 10 year plan, which we said uh, from before uh, the uh, design of the referendum that we would support and we would work collaboratively to put in place. In addition to that, we've said we'd work with the uh, Capital Regional District to improve transit and transit governance there, and we would put money into transit funding to enhance it in every corner of the province. The simple fact is that the provincial government pays uh, money for transportation infrastructure all over the province. It needs to be equitable. Pulling two bridges out of all of the roads and bridges around the province is not equitable, and all it's done in Metro is increase congestion on the Papalo and Westminster and increase greenhouse gas emissions. We need an equitable, fair policy that reduces GHGs. All right, thank you very much to all of you. Um, and we have one more question for you. Um, and this question is coming from us here at the Pemina Institute for you. Uh, to meet our economy-wide targets, we will need to reduce carbon pollution resulting from the combustion of natural gas and oil in buildings. Um, this will require gains in energy efficiency. We've talked a little bit about this today. And it will also require switching the fuel that buildings use to either clean electricity or low carbon district energy systems. What policies would your government put in place to meet these goals? And we will go with Mary, George, and Andrew for this last question. Great, thank you. I've covered part of this in the earlier answer. Um, but a big focus um, focus area of our uh, of our climate plan is around uh, getting to net zero buildings uh, and uh, beginning with that net zero ready plan. Um, when we start looking at what that means in um, communities around the province, it's one of the reasons that we've been working with uh, local governments. It's because it's not just Metro Vancouver, although that's obviously a significant uh, place, but it's also in communities that are developing and growing and how do they plan their communities so that they're ready. Um, so we've been working with them as well. Uh, many of them do have district gen district energy uh, programs, things like that that we have supported. Um, but I think it starts with those transitions. So the regulations that are going to start changing the way that people build, uh, giving those incentives for the retrofitting, uh, trying to plan for that phasing. Because of course, when you have a lot of existing buildings, um, it's not something you can do overnight, and it's something you have to do in a way. Uh, that allows people to make that transition. We think that with our climate plan and the pieces that are in place around the built environment, we've created a pathway um, that is going to take people in that correct direction um, so they can get to the place uh, where we're taking uh, the demand essentially away. Because it's one thing to say you want to stop taking uh, fossil fuels out of the ground, uh, but the flip side of that is we have to change what is demanding um, that. So uh, I do think um, a significant part of that is the incentives that we've provided uh, around um, gas-fired boilers, things of that nature, and incentives into that retrofitting, um, whether it's in your individual homes or indeed uh, in the broader sector. Okay, great. Thank you very much.
Uh, over to George. Thank you, and I've never been able to figure out why the provincial government under Christy Clark would establish a climate leadership team with experts uh, from across uh, British Columbian society, uh, undergo uh, exercises in economic modeling, have an interrelated set of recommendations, and then essentially ignore all of them and establish a climate plan that just focuses on one or two things. The recommendations were interrelated, and one of them was to uh, reduce by 2030 uh, emissions from the built environment and uh, buildings and homes by by 50 percent below 2015 levels. We accept that, we adopt that, and far in advance of having done that, we put forward uh, the plan called Power BC that starts with retrofitting public buildings, uh, goes on to retrofitting commercial buildings and, and uh, residential homes, and uh, also we would be and will be totally supportive as we invest a significant amount of money in infrastructure, in uh, building uh, 114,000 uh, rental uh, purchase co-op and social housing units in a variety of forms around British Columbia over uh, a 10-year period in ensuring that those meet the highest standards of energy efficiency. Uh, there's tremendous job creation potential in this. There's tremendous potential to provide incentives to people through revolving loan, pays you save programs, as well as carbon pricing. Carbon pricing should be an incentive. It should not be a punishment. So to ensure it's not a punishment, we need to aggressively pursue and provide alternatives that help people make the changes to their existing homes and provide a, a housing stock for them to move into, as well as deal with the issue of residential or commercial and public buildings very aggressively. Okay, thank you, George. And Andrew, last word goes to you. Oh, you're on mute. We can't hear you. And um, any strategy towards uh, move to, to move towards uh, low carbon, zero carbon emissions requires a coordinated approach at multiple levels, and from the built environment as well as one of our single biggest household well, single biggest household emissions, which is uh, the the uh, transportation sector. You know, with the transportation sector, we have a barrier right now for implementation. That is, we do not have the widespread infrastructure in place to allow people to charge. We will, we will, uh, there's, there's, and there's red tape that's stopping it. Right now, you could not put in a charger and charge people to use it because you'd have to register as a utility to do so. So, you know, there are red tapes that we need to remove to allow uh, for the, uh, the building of this infrastructure to allow people to actually charge for the electricity so that you could charge up cars. We continue on with the investment in the, in, in the ZEV. We bring in a ZEV standard in British Columbia as well. Uh, in terms of the built environment, as we need, as we move away from using natural gas, we'll need to move towards increased use of electricity. That in turn will require increased supply, but incremental supply, which is why we'll start to work with First Nations and others to, to actually bring in wind capacity and use existing batter dams as storage batteries to level the load. So BC Transit is in the, is in the business of leveling load and transmitting power, and, and the, the, the communities and partnerships with, uh, are in the business of producing uh, power. We can produce them nearer to the, to, the, to the consumption, which saves in transmission loss. There are so many ways of being innovative. We look at some companies like Vetter and Westport, two, two successful BC-based companies that, have, uh, that are looking in the long-haul sector, bringing natural gas for long-haul transport. We would encourage that as well. So there, there, there is so much that can be done. Uh, most of it is low-hanging fruit. It just requires leadership and a will, and all of that is predicated on an increasing carbon price to actually send a signal to market that this is the direction you're heading. Fantastic. Just under the wire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our conversation today. I'd like to thank very much our three candidates for taking the time to answer our questions, um, uh, thoughtfully answer those, and, and also to our panelists who prepared questions for today and to all of, uh, all of you out there who have been joining us to listen in on our conversation today. Um, we, uh, we will be, this webinar has been recorded and we will be posting it on our website later today so you can, you can re-watch it or share it with other folks uh, as, you, as you want. And I just want to also let you know that um, our friends at the Energy Forum and BC Sustainable Energy Association are hosting another webinar tomorrow. Um, I think some of you may be participating in that. And uh, they, uh, the, I think some of the conversations we started today will be continued there again tomorrow, so make sure to check that out if you want to uh, continue this conversation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, to thank you again and uh, wish you a good rest of your day.
Thank you, Joshua. Thanks.